Good evening, everybody. Welcome to episode nine of We Are Listening. I'm SK Shlomo, and this is my live stream series that I do every month um, as a space to talk about mental health. Um, it's been an absolute joy doing this. I've been doing it every month since last summer, um, and just have a safe space where I can talk with friends and colleagues and um, other people of interest about journeys, about mental health, about stories, um, and also getting to know you guys, the audience has just been incredible. So thank you everyone who's been part of this so far, who sent us messages and us stories and connected. Um, we record this in advance, uh, but we are online right now. So if you have any comments, you type them there, we will be replying to them straight away. And I would like to introduce you to my guests for this month. We have Johnny and Neil, who I'm very excited to meet. Um, <laughs> Neil Laybourne and um, Johnny Benjamin, MBE, um, for his services for mental health. And you guys, um, yeah, I'm really excited to have you because as, as I was just saying to you just before we came online, like so far in this series, I've been um, feeling like a bit of an outsider in the world of mental health, like being a musician who, who wanted to start talking about it and wanted to start a conversation. And then throughout that process, I've started to meet more and more people who are kind of already in that world and well-versed in it. And and kind of making leaps and bounds in that world. So, um, yeah, I approached these guys after I went to their conference. You guys have got your conference, haven't you? This can happen, which um, I attended, and it was amazing. It was like hundreds and hundreds of people from businesses all talking about how, um, you know, they can tackle mental health or raise awareness or help employees, uh, and I felt like it was a really inspiring day, and that's why I approached you. So, guys, welcome. Welcome Thank to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. How are you doing? Great. <laughs> yeah, well, it's... Um, <laughs> It's a uh, full-on day today, mm. lots of activity together. We just came from talking to a school. Um, actually, it was quite a big day because it was the school where Johnny went to. Mm. Um, and in our talks that we give around mental health, I always listen to Johnny talk about JFS. Mm. And um, so I got to go there today. So that was <clears throat> that was good. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. And like, so I feel like... Your story is always really fascinating in terms of like how you guys met. Um, I heard about you guys from my therapist. She, she told me about these these amazing guys because I was trying to find charities to support when I did my um, uh, album crowdfunding campaign. And she was like, "Have you heard of these guys?" So like, do you want to tell it in your words, like how you guys kind of met and then the whole story behind Stranger on the Bridge and all of this? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So we met uh, ten. Oh, it's 10 years ago, yeah. It's 11. 11 years ago now. So, so. <laughs> um, yeah, well, 11 years ago. Um, so I was, uh, when I was 20, I was diagnosed with something called schizoaffective disorder. It's a combination of schizophrenia and bipolar. And um, yeah, I was really unwell. So I've been unwell for a while, but um, that's the first time I went into hospital, into a psychiatric hospital. And... Um, I don't know, I just, I gave up uh, in the hospital. The hospital was just, um, there was like this sense of just hopelessness in the hospital. And no one around me was getting any better. And I, well, I just got worse in this hospital. And so a month, a month into my stay there, um, I don't know, something just kind of in my head just snapped. Like one night, something just kind of went, I can't do this anymore. And you know, the only way out was to end my life. There was no other way out. Because it was just, it, it just, it felt like a nightmare. And yeah, um, there was only one way out of the nightmare, really. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 I made a plan to run away from the hospital, and to go to this bridge, and I did the next day. Um, so this was now the beginning of 2008. Um, and yeah, I ran, I ran away that morning from the hospital and um, uh, suddenly did a cigarette, they let me out and I ran and I went to this bridge uh, and uh, went onto the edge of this bridge. And yeah, um, that's where we met, that's when Neil approached me and stood next to me. <clears throat> Rode up on my horse and... <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so... At that time, I just started working in London. So I grew up in Watford, Hertfordshire, and I started working as a personal trainer. And uh, I was working in Covent Garden, Virgin Active Health Club, you know, Virgin. Yeah, so. And my daily walk was over Waterloo Bridge every morning. Um, and 
I was really new to the job actually. I've only been there a month and it was just a normal Monday morning as far as I was concerned. <clears throat> so I'm working over Waterloo Bridge and saw Johnny. Um, yeah, it, it was just uh, obviously the most bizarre sight, somebody sitting on the edge of a, edge of a bridge and you, know, you, you just don't see that. Like, I hadn't seen that before. So lots and lots of people walking past and um, I got the opportunity to just say, hi mate, are you okay? And um, you know, which obviously is a split second decision because you're like, is that okay? Should I do that? You know, nobody else was, so you kind of think maybe I should keep walking as well. And um, but no, I did. I, I said, you know, are you okay? And um, that's where that's where our relationship began. That very day, we we spoke for like thirty minutes on Waterloo Bridge, and um, yeah, we connected. We just we just connected. Um, Johnny was telling me about like where he grew up. But, like l later on, you know, later on, once you know he sort of warmed up to me right? mm -hmm. um, and we found out that we grew up really close to one another so me being from Watford Johnny grew up in Harrow mm -hmm. so that was cool and we talked about that and uh, essentially like um, I said can we go for a coffee we sit down talk about it you know because um, I, I didn't <clears throat> can keep talking on this the edge of this bridge you know, yeah. forever and ever and um, we were about to go for a coffee you know Johnny had sat down from the bridge and um, I actually can remember just like not the day that I had in front of me just completely drifted away like I was like I really want to sit down really want to continue this this conversation um, very long story short the police intervened and uh, and um, yeah that was uh, they took Johnny and I uh, I just carried on to work and I thought that was that was it mm. and then it was um it was six years later that we, um, Johnny, reached out um, to find me, um, yeah. and uh, but you were called Mike. I was called Mike. Mind. I mean, and, and obviously, <laughs> yeah. like Johnny, you know, there's a lot that happened for Johnny. Yeah. Obviously, during that time, um, and me, you know, um, don't know if you wanna. Yeah, I. I well, firstly, I think you know. Um, that interaction on the bridge, uh, it it was uh, it was it was such a sort of powerful interaction. It was really, it, uh, it was really like <laughs> sounds really like simple, but it was it was really sort of human. And I in the hospital where I was, there was a lack of um, yeah, sort of humanness, if that makes sense. You know, mm. I don't know, it was just. This was the first time someone had really like really listened, like really listened, like you know, like no, no, no judgment and mm. no sort of like we need to do this, you need to do this, just listen, just really listen. And uh, I think the key thing was him saying to me, just very like um, simply, he was like, "Mate, you'll get better, you'll be fine." And again, like in the hospital, they were saying, "Well, we don't know what's going to happen to you." and just hearing, you know, those words, you know, you'll be all right, you'll get better. It's, it just, I know it sounds really simple, but for me, yeah, I think that's why I needed someone to, but but someone to really believe it, mm. you know, um, and he did. And and getting better was not <laughs> was a was it was a <laughs> not an easy process. Um, not that I'm <laughs> cured, but. Mm. Getting to a place where I, um, I think acceptance was a big thing, and talking was talk, finally talking about it. I was so embarrassed, um, like all this stuff had happened in my head, or was going on in my head, and the diagnosis. I was struggling with my sexuality, so there was so much that was going on, and it took me years to finally like really get comfortable with that and accept and start talking. And and when I finally like started talking, finally. That's when I um, decided to launch this campaign to find Neil. Um, I was working for a mental health charity at the time called Rethink, Rethink Mental Illness. And they, I told them my story and they were the ones that said to me, um, you know, have you ever thought of trying to find this guy? Mm. You know, and I was like, um, it just seemed, it, was, it seemed impossible because 
yeah, it, it felt like looking for a needle in a haystack because he could be anywhere. Do you know what I mean? Like, I didn't. We didn't swap details on the bridge, so how are we going to find it? Um, but amazingly, like through social media, like it just, it just took off. This campaign, this Find Mike campaign, um, just took off, and. Um, the most amazing thing was we had in a, in a few days we had thirty eight people come forward saying I think it was me <laughs> that helped you on the bridge, yeah. um, which just blew our minds. Like yeah. the most like incredible thing is that these people had stopped someone on a bridge in London yeah. around that time. That's amazing. It's amazing, isn't it? All these um, so we call them like silent heroes, like people like Neil, like you know, just I mean, cities like London, you know, people are so in their own worlds and just rushing and no one's got time for each other, but they do, they do, you know, these, these people, it's just amazing. Um, so there were 38 people who'd talked someone off of Waterloo Bridge around that time. Around that a, time. A man. Or, yeah, or yeah, yeah. Bridge. So that's like alarming in lots of ways as well, isn't it? I know. Like, that that was happening. Yeah. But it's hard yeah. that 38 people thought that Absolutely. they'd safety. It, well, you know, yeah, what's, yeah. what's bizarre as well is, I mean, um, I've been working in London since 2007 through to now, so you know that's 12 years, right? And it is so common, yeah. yet I've never actually seen anybody else. Yeah. But we know it happens all the time. Yeah, right. And so, I mean, it's so, it's almost, I can't quite believe it because, like, we, we know lots of other people in our network who have, you know, um, taught people off bridges or seen and. You know, and now you mean that you've met since you've become active in mental health. Exactly. Championing, or whatever you call your job. And now they're, yeah, <laughs> what, what is that? Like, I just, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's, it's bizarre, how, you know, what we're doing now and where it all came from. But a lot of those people, I mean, there's more awareness now, right? So they know I should mm. go because it's in the media and stuff. But yeah, like, I've, I've never seen, you know, so... Um, I don't know if I'd be any good at it again. <laughs> of course, you're good, man. No, I mean, you, yeah, it's that kindness in your heart. That's what. Yeah. That's yeah. what did it. It's like that, that ain't going anywhere. Mm. No, it's so it's, it's it's so prevalent. I mean, I guess just to frame the conversation, if people don't know, mm. it's still the biggest killer of men in this country, right? Suicide, mm. Mm. and um, quite a lot of men go to bridges, right? So, mm. but yeah, it's um, yeah, thirty-eight people. Yeah. But but. Yeah, he <laughs> he didn't come forward for uh he kept us waiting uh for what was it two weeks before he finally came forward. Um <laughs> So I was like how how what first of all, what did you have to say to the thirty seven people who weren't your saviour? How did you let them down? Well no, well, well well I see I I the charity that that I was working with spoke to them all like they they tried to sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um we just Basically took took their accounts of the of, of what had happened and they were just different to my accounts. So we yeah. were like, look, it's not the same. Could you remember person. what you looked like and stuff like that? See, only when we were eventually reunited did it all like come back to me yeah. and that was that was just unbelievable. But um yeah. Um but yeah, it, it w w once like we'd got into like the second <coughs> week of the campaign, we were just like, Well, we saw he would have come forward by now, you know? Mm. Uh, if he wants to be found and, you know, maybe he doesn't want to be found and that's fine, you know? Or maybe he doesn't... We just kind of yeah. accepted that that was the way it was. But, <laughs> yeah, he took his he took his time. Yeah. So then, what was it like from your end? Like, how did you... did you What, what did you see? Were you like, <laughs> hang on a minute, that's me? Like, what happened? No, I... <clears throat> I missed the whole campaign, I didn't see any of it. So, <clears throat> it was through the power of social media. Which we were talking about before we go on here, mm. like... And ironically, I'm kind of off social media now, right. which is how I manage a lot of my own mindfulness and stuff, which yeah. we'll talk about later. But um, mm. I I wasn't on, funny enough, I don't think I was even on Facebook. I, I know, the, I was in 2014. When we talked, I wasn't, no. But it was my it was my fiancée, Sarah. Mm. Um, at the time, she was my fiancée. She's now mm. my wife, right? Um, and she is, yeah. and... And we were boyfriend and girlfriend when I had the conversation with, right. with Johnny on the bridge, right? So yeah. she'd known the story from the beginning. You know, I'd uh -huh. spoken to her about it. And um, she saw this Find Mike campaign on Facebook. And um, she was like, that's, that's Neil. And she called me up and um, 
I was at home and she was just like, <laughs> the guy that you spoke to six years ago on Waterloo Bridge, so completely out of the blue, you know, six years later, completely out of the blue. And it, yeah, it just completely blew my mind. I mean, I was just like, wow, you know, I, I, it, it always really stuck with me, the conversation we'd had, you know, because I was in a good place. Obviously, I remember everything about Johnny, like his mannerisms, everything, like what he looked yeah. like and, and everything. And um, So you must have been wondering all that time if he'd been okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I had thought, had he gone back, had he taken his life, and those sorts of things. Yeah. And, and always, it sounds funny. <laughs> I'd remembered the conversation quite fondly, yeah. because I actually thought by the time he'd stepped off the bridge and we were about to go for a coffee, we actually had a really good connection. Yeah. And Johnny disagrees, but I say <laughs> we would have been mates when we were at school. Right. <laughs> um. But he's like, no, we wouldn't. I don't. I still don't know why. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I was, I was like, I was like a SWAT at school. Nothing wrong with that, but like, <laughs> I was, I was a SWAT. I was a grade student. I was like top of the class. Whereas you were. Oh a bit yeah, of a, I got not so much. I bunked off. <laughs> I got nearly suspended for like they found a joint in my pocket. Oh, and, you know, yeah. I yeah, I was the. I wasn't a bad. You know, school was like. Um, School was like an episode of the Beano comic, you know, Bass Street Kids. Yeah. That was like that was you. That was me, right? You're causing trouble. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. You know, everyone was causing trouble. But anyway, I thought we, because <laughs> we connected on the bridge, we'd actually, mm. and we're about to go for a coffee. So, yeah, I, I actually thought quite fondly of the conversation for mm. me. But I guess you weren't, you weren't in a traumatized state that day, which is like it would have been really hard yeah. for your brain to take any of that information in, like yeah. what he looks like or or name. Well, no, so you did get each other's name, but you just you didn't remember it, or you think that never came up? I don't think I remember your name was jo- like when I saw on the Facebook post Johnny. Yeah, maybe it started coming back. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So we did meet. So it was through Sarah, my girlfriend, fiance, wife, <laughs> uh, the only one ever, <laughs> the wonderful Sarah, <laughs> yeah. um, that we were reunited. Which is again, when you think about it, that's bizarre, right? In its own kind mm. of, um, and. Saw, saw that on Facebook, I reached out to the charity, there was a lot of back and forth, and then they reunited us, and basically Johnny's just followed me around. Was <laughs> 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 well, it the other way around? Maybe I followed you around. Um, and I but tell you, you, it's just been like, we would always think, I was, there was a lot of press around the story, mm. and I was like, I don't know anything about mental health at mm. all. Mm. And the charity, Rethink Mental Illness, was saying, well, there's some there's some buzz around this campaign, right? Johnny was already a mental health campaigner, mm. and uh, they said, "Can you guys go on TV together? Here's the statistics. Here's the headlines. Here's what to say. Here's not what not to say." Mm. And I was kind of like, "Yeah, this is really exciting." But mainly, I was, and it went on for a couple of weeks. Mm. Mainly, it was just because I was really intrigued by Johnny, mm. and I just wanted to be like, right, another chance to spend the afternoon with Johnny, yeah, find right. about this guy. You know, it was a bit kind of voyeuristic, you know, it was weird, like, who, you know, yeah. we had this chat and now there's this whole campaign. So that's how, that was how I started, you know, to, to get into mental health. Um, and that's continued for the past five years, obviously, twists and turns and evolutions. Um, and that's how I joined Johnny. Mm. Johnny was already active campaigner and that's how I ended up getting into this now which is yeah what what we do together yeah what johnny does what i do yeah and now you run charity together you've got your own foundation yeah that's really exciting like your own conference like yeah like uh, particularly i'm really because uh, the, the the charity i could talk about all day not just it, no not the charity but the reason it's all about young people and like that's where it starts you know that's He's going to talk for 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Talk, man. That's what we're here for. Well, we know we've just come from a school and, um, you know, some of the young people that we were talking to, I mean, you know, they come to us at the end. Whenever we do school talks at schools, you know, we have, like, groups of pupils come up to us and, like, it's it's really heartbreaking, some of the things that, you know, for the first time they open up and, you know, the tears come and... all this stuff they've been holding on to and um yeah so it's it's yeah it breaks my heart because um th- there needs to be so much more um 
help and support and and the whole education. Well, yeah, they're, they're just <laughs> it. It doesn't make sense because you know we know that three quarters of all mental health issues start in adolescence. So mm. why is it not more of a priority and focus? It doesn't make sense. So our charity is all about yeah getting stuff into uh, schools and colleges and universities and you know like the youth justice system where people are just like chucked out. Um, yeah, getting it in early and, and getting help and support early because people, young people are waiting and there's that stigma and there's oh, so much that we need to do. So it's really exciting. I think we can hopefully make a difference with the with the charity uh, Beyond Shame, Beyond Stigma. Mm. Um, yeah, I want to make a real... And, and, not just fa- and not just young people, but like families. We talk to so many families who are... You know, my parents, like, <laughs> didn't have a clue. Like, when I was diagnosed, with where to go, who to turn to, how to get support for themselves. Um, and you know teachers as well we see so many teachers struggling so we want to just help everyone you know involved in in, in young people and, and supporting them amazing what an amazing story that like do you know what I mean just the amount of richness in that narrative like even just from the very beginning when you told us that you were like um, diagnosed age 20 and then you ended up in a hospital like uh, there's so many questions from, from me like do you feel like the the atmosphere you were describing of like no positivity, no one telling you you're going to be okay. Like, do you feel like things would have changed since then? Like, if if someone gets taken into an establishment now, mm, it's, do you know what? And this is another kind of thing with with mental health uh, treatment. Like, it's so varied. Like, you might go to one like hospital in one town and it's great, but then the next town they won't have any beds or there'll be a lack of staff or the treatment will just be really poor. It's such a postcode lottery uh, mm. wherever you go for mental health treatment. So it just depends. But I mean, I've been I've been into quite a few hospitals um, like as an inpatient because, you know, I, I've had relapses over the years, so I have to go back into hospital. And um, but again, like I, I, it's, it's the humanness, like mm. it's the humanness, like the human, like, you know, um, just... I, I, I was giving a talk yesterday to, to a group of nurses and it's sometimes it's just the smallest things that make the biggest difference. Like, you know, it's just a smile, like when you're walking down the corridor or just someone coming in and like to your room and like being like, oh, you know, what, what, what book are you reading? Or, you know, what were you up to? Just, just yeah, just that human quality. And I, I say to doctors and, you know, put down the clipboards, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, actually talk and listen to, you know, your patients because, I don't know, I see that so often, like, yeah, so on a scale of one to ten, you know, and I, I get they have to do that, but, you know, then put down the clipboard and, you know, really listen and really listen and, and let them talk and don't judge and, and, and you know, um, I see that sometimes missing. I mean, I, I feel like I'm criticising. Mm. Um, I don't mean, to, I mean, there's some amazing people out there, amazing people, but sometimes, um, yeah, I just feel there could be more... Um, Connectedness, humanness. Mm. Again, I keep on using humanness mm. in, in 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 the system. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Hey guys, if you just joined us, this is episode nine of We Are Listening, uh, which is a monthly live stream where we talk about mental health. And today I have uh, Neil and Johnny from. Let me get the name of your foundation right. Beyond Shame, Beyond Stigma. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I also wanted to talk to you about your your conference. This can happen, which mm. is how I kind of was able to reach out to you guys. Do you want to tell us about how that kind of came about and what it's all about? Cool. Um, <clears throat> so the documentary of our story came out right in 2015 and that was Channel 4 documentary called Stranger on the Bridge and um, it pretty soon after that documentary we were getting contacted by various companies right because I, I I didn't know this at all I didn't know this world at all so companies love to bring in people to tell stories right for their staff and so as you know right because you did yeah, that as well I did right? that. Mm. okay so mm. you know, I'll probably learn a lot from you today you know <laughs> um so completely untrained right completely you know raw and unpolished um our first our first talk was uh I think our first talk together was we we were doing a talk for um, an NHS trust, and Johnny had already booked in. He said, "Do you want to come to do it? They're gonna, you know, pay a bit of money. It's quite cool." I was like, "You know what? Okay, fine. You know, it's a bit of an experiment." Were you still working in fitness? Still doing fitness. Mm. Yeah, still doing fitness. I said, "Yeah, I'd love to." And we we, we drove up there, and um, Johnny, 
I was driving, Johnny had the laptop and we were literally putting it together on the way. Mm -hmm. Like he was like putting images of me in there. I was like, what do I say? And you know, actually we delivered it and it went down really, really well. I didn't know, I was really nervous. Like I would get like feel nauseous. And um, and that was, that was kind of like the very start really. And actually just on that note, um, that specific mental health trust, which was in Grimsby in the north of England, completely unrelated. We went to a university to do a okay. Two years later, and the young lady who was head of the Students' Mental Health Network who, who put that talk on at that university was an inpatient and in the audience at that first talk that we gave two years before. Wow. You know, And she said, I saw that talk, I listened to Johnny talk about his mental health, I heard about the interaction on the bridge, and, and it really... You know, inspired me to keep going with my you know obviously one small part she had clinicians but I, I just thought that was yeah. you know that kind of that nails in the worthwhileness of kind of getting out there and talking so anyway we get contacted by banks and law firms and and, and, and all sorts of weird and other wonderful places and after going so many places I kind of realized well you know what like if there's if, if there's a way that we can just create a platform where we can get people, companies, be, you know, to talk about it themselves. Because obviously, you know, companies have a different set of issues in dealing with problems than the NHS does, than, mm. than the schools does. So we well, let's try and create something that companies would engage with to do it. And that's how we met, because um, you came along to yeah. that. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's quite a new thing, and it's, you know, gonna be gonna be ongoing. Mm. And um, you know we still we still go into a lot of places and um, companies, schools, universities, mm. and we use the the story that we've just described mm. to to set the scene. Mm. And now you know talk about if we're in a, if we're in a company, we try and shed some light about what we've seen. Like what are people doing to look after their staff, their employees, their well being? If we go mm. into a school, try and talk about. You know, well, how how can two kids who don't know anything about mental health and you know are ashamed to to talk up, you know, how can they connect and look after each other? Mm. You know, like Johnny said, nurses, you know, stretch for time, resources. How mm. can they connect with patients? So we try to share the the collective experience that we've heard mm. and learned from um, talking to the staff or the people who work in those organisations or the people who use those organizations um you know to get support themselves you know so that's all it is it's it's pretty much just finding any excuse to to share that information mm. um and <laughs> i got an email from you after the conference um because johnny couldn't couldn't make it actually you weren't well at the time mm. which is just the reality of things mm. um so i was holding the fort uh, and uh, I got an email from you like hi Neil and I came and we didn't get a chance to connect on the day and um, I was like wow this is interesting he's a beatboxer he's working with Ed Sheeran like, <laughs> he's Jewish Johnny's Jewish that's cool yeah. need to connect. so like I, um, we, we talked on the phone and then the next day mm. um, or a couple of days later I was having lunch with Johnny and his dad and I was like so I've got to tell you about this really interesting guy that I just had a chat with on the phone and that's when I showed Johnny your um, belly dancer yeah. video. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and here we are. And here we are. Yeah. And so actually, we've got a little bit to learn about you and uh, as well still, um, sure. which I'm completely intrigued about yeah. you know, as well. Well, I think it's... Um, I'm, I'm enjoying just hearing you guys talk about this because I can see, like, you have told that story before, obviously. Mm. It's, it's now your thing. Like, and then that's kind of what's sort of been happening to me like I decided to be open about my own mental health um at the beginning of last summer and I'd never really told anyone like before that like only my partner really knew not even like friends and definitely not fans and um but I'd been I'd kind of I'd, I'd stopped touring I'd spent my whole adult life on the road like I wouldn't go a week without a show since I was since I left home and I'm 35 now so I'd a lot of shows and a lot of just a lot of kind of whirlwind lifestyle and when I um decided to I decided to cancel all my work so I could write an album uh which was a really brave thing to do even though looking back it was slightly insane 
Um, and then, yeah, the insanity followed because I didn't have any distraction anymore. I didn't have... Like, when you're on the road, and this is something that I've kind of been remembering this last couple of weeks because I've just started going back out on the road for the first time properly in a couple of years. So in the last week, we did 12 shows in eight days. And when you're on the road, it's the craziest highs and the craziest lows all at once. But you have this thing where it's like, it doesn't matter because tomorrow there's going to be literally a queue of people, literally telling me how great I am. So like, there's going to be a high, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that is not sustainable for your brain. Like what you're asking your, your mind to do in terms of like physically what you're trying to do, it's like the kind of waves of like dopamine and the different endorphins that you get released when you which you guys must have experienced now you must have had those those talks where you're just like on top of the world and you just feel so empowered um and then inevitably that isn't going to last forever you're good you're going to feel some pain afterwards um but i'd kept that going for so long that when i finally stopped my my mind just gave out on me it was just like i can't i can't um and you know i didn't get as far as get, getting up on a bridge but i got um into a, it's hard, I still find it hard to find the language, but I guess it's the suicidal place. Like I didn't want to live anymore, and I didn't feel safe, and I, and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do with myself, and I, I couldn't write any more music, and I couldn't go anywhere. Um, and that realization and that honesty I could give myself was was so empowering because then once I could. Ex explain it to my partner and then a doctor and then a therapist and then I found out a whole lot about why I'd been on the road the whole time, why I'd been running the whole time, like yeah. why I never felt like I could stop and it turned out um, I had PTSD and a whole bunch of other issues that hadn't been dealt with since childhood and uh, having worked through that I just felt like this music I'd been making was was all about that story and if I didn't kind of open up about that I just felt like I couldn't progress with the music I couldn't do you almost feel like you you weren't being true or exactly I couldn't like... just be like and I, and I don't know it's difficult because I've seen artists who I'm who've written songs where I'm listening to it, I'm like that's about anxiety that song's about a panic attack and then I've seen them be interviewed and they're like what's the song about they're like oh you know it's abstract it's it's up to you to, to interpret, which is, you know, I fully respect that. But I've always been quite a kind of open, you know, heart on my sleeve kind of person. So I just felt like I wouldn't be able to do it. And it, it actually, I'd actually feel less safe if I didn't um, just be open. And then I did. So I did. I just opened up about it. I, I launched my album with the crowdfunding campaign. And I was like, guys, I've told you something. I've been having a hideous time. <laughs> yeah. And I hadn't told anyone, and I'm really sorry that I haven't told you. And then, yeah, the, my world changed. But then, like, that's it. So that's why I was kind of interested to talk to you guys as people who've, who've done that, you know, years ago, um, you know, said, we want to have a conversation about mental health. We are making it okay. Because the minute I did that, I just got swept down, honestly. I got hundreds and hundreds of messages. Um, I still get them every day. Well, really. And at first it was overwhelming, but now it's like normal. Something, me. you know, I don't know where we'll go off on a conversation, but I mean, look, thank you for sharing because I never assumed that you have an audience and they may have heard of that, that before, that story. Um, I don't disclose about mental health, right? So mm. for a long time, when we first started talking um, to people, we were doing a lot with charities mind rethink mental illness samaritans nhs trusts and a lot of the people and there were other people talking like johnny right who mm. lived experience and i don't you know what i do uh, kind of need to admit is that you know there was definitely there was definite almost like imposter syndrome after a while kind of like hold on a minute i don't have a mental health diagnosis right mm. not saying i haven't dealt with stuff but yeah and you do question your own credibility and like you said, you know, we'd experience, you know, people coming up and um, after talks and sometimes mm. there'd be queues of people because so many people have been affected, right? Mm. Now, you know, so you deal with that and we did travel a lot. And um, 
I think what I think part of the workplace stuff as well was because um, you know there are a bunch of other people who weren't did not necessarily have mental health issues, but their job role was to support other people. Mm. And even just thinking about it now, I think you know I needed to find a place mm. where I wasn't feeding my own imposter syndrome, right? Because you know it's so great and amazing, like going like today we went to this school and we did a talk and young children were opening up and they were talking about their mental health issues and you can feel like sometimes a bit well I don't have this experience so why yeah. why would people listen to me mm. and um, you know I see Johnny talk and his place and his ownership is really something that he you know and you do like you wrestle with that because you're kind of like should I even be mm. now you know and and Sorry, so yeah, so that's that also was kind of the reason why that whole event took place, mm. you know, because I needed to find a space as well where I could say, well, I'm with other people who don't have mental health diagnoses, but they're having mm. to do stuff. So that was, um, and all the stuff you talked about, you know, we've travelled, haven't we, like, and, you know, it's, it's hard, isn't it, to, what's your identity, why are you doing this, what's the passion, what's the purpose, what... You know, all of that stuff. Can I just say, though, like, <laughs> <laughs> we came out of the school today, and um, uh, I say this every time we go to a school. Neil is, like, amazing with the kids. Like, he just... I'll never forget, there was one school that we went to, and um, a massive queue afterwards, and this one young guy queued up for, like, an hour to finally get to the front of the line, and all he did was he was like, mate, he said to Neil, I just want to shake your hand. And that was it. Yeah. I mean, like, he queued up, <laughs> queued up for an hour because, like, you know... He waited um, patiently behind... He was, mm. you know... <laughs> but that's, that up, speaks volumes, yeah. though, doesn't yeah. it? Like, you know? Like, and every time, like, we went, like, I came out of the school today and... Because um, he, yeah, like, you know... It's not just about me and my lived experience. It's about, obviously... What Neil calls it, you know, being an ally, you know? We need... We need nice need those allies you know mm. um and um yeah he, he underestimates himself and how amazing he is like talking to the young people who come forwards and no but i always say that to him because um you know talking about the imposter syndrome but um that yeah. has come up actually on this stream quite a few times where okay. people feel like oh like i think pretty much everyone i've met it's like, oh, my mind isn't that bad. Like, so other people that suffer worse than me. And it's mm. like, and then you feel like you're not qualified to help people or you feel like maybe you've misled them or, I don't know, I, I struggled with that a whole lot. I was really worried before I kind of spoke up about what I'd been through that people would think I was doing it for attention or for sympathy. Yeah. Because, like, I mean, a part, you know, there's a part of me that was doing that. Do you know what I mean? I'm not ashamed to say it. But like, I also was like, well, my life wasn't that, you know, my life's been, I've lived a really privileged life. Like I can't sit there and just go, where is me? Do you know what I mean? I get, I get that, like, like, yeah, like, especially when I'm giving talks like doctors and like yesterday, like psychologists, I'm like, well, cause I feel like, um, I just, well, yeah, I feel, you know, I'm really lucky because I'm here, mm. you know, and, um, uh, I've got amazing friends and family. I've really, I've, I've got a lot of support and a lot of love, and you know, um, I've been able to kind of get an insight into my into my head. And there's so we meet so many people that you know are really really suffering and struggling, and there's a feeling of guilt. I feel a lot of guilt, like um, yeah, like why why me? Like that's, yeah, why like what's so special about me? Why should I be mm. doing this? Like um, yeah, there's a feeling of uh, yeah, just I don't know, yeah, just. What's the word? Um, inferiority. Mm. You know, like um, especially when you're talking to. <laughs> you have it too. <laughs> so, like, you're, you know, we're That's learning. It. We're learning right here. You know. Like. But this is the, this is the theme that I've noticed. It's like, it's, and it's, then if you want to support other people, like, you don't necessarily have to have been through hell to be able to to help someone else. Like you guys are perfect case in point. And also, like. You say you use a language that you haven't had a mental health diagnosis, but like we all have mental health. Mm. It's like saying I haven't had a physical health diagnosis, so I can't mm. relate. Of course mm. you can. Like, yeah. do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, because I'm being very cryptic. Because of course, <laughs> like, there's stuff where, I mean, I'm a 36 year old guy. Um, I like many other 
men, right, mm. are conditioned not to talk about things that you find embarrassing, not, right. you know, and you hold that in. And mm. so, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, we talk about mental health. So, you know, I'm not going to say I haven't had a mental health issue because mm. actually, as you said, we all have mental health. We carry it around with us, you know, and you can experience stuff that, especially when you're growing up, especially when you're younger, you know, mm. you question things like, you know, why am I here? What am I doing? Um, and ju ju just life is can be very difficult. Mm. Um, and there's an acute side where you would be like, right, I need to sit in front of a clinician. I need to reach out and actually go and get some help, you know. Um, I've done that, like, you know, family. Like, if I've mm. struggled, I've... But I haven't had to cross that barrier mm. of, you know... So that's how, when I talk to an audience, mm. you know, I'm sort of saying... I don't know if they get it or not, but you mm. actually, again, it just shows how sensitive you are to the subject and your own intuition, which is really good. Because not like, a lot of people mm. would pick that up, <laughs> mm. you know? So that's... I think it's interesting, like... Um, because you you have got what I would say really healthy boundaries because you're confident to talk about mental health you've made a whole mission out of it but you're you know what you want to disclose you know you, you've got that language of what you know what you're comfortable with uh, you acknowledge that you've been through some stuff but it's you know that's that's really strong and for me that was probably one of the hardest things about deciding to be open was working out where my boundaries were because the very first time I told anyone about it was when I was trying to approach a doctor and I was trying the very first thing I did was try and phone a, a helpline and it was such a big deal to just dial the number I was shaking it took me mm. three nights of attempting to do it and then no one answered which was just mm. really brutal and I was like right well I'll email and I wrote this email honestly it was a page as long as like my whole life story wow. was that and like cathartic to get that out kind of, it was a big it. step really big step just to write it all down all the stuff I was worrying about and then do you know what I did? Oh no. <laughs> I deleted it all and I was just like, I'm struggling with um, depression and anxiety, I think I need some help. And I just sent that. That's all I needed to send, do you know what I mean? But all of that, mm. boiling it down and, and, and finding your language and your vocabulary is actually, is hard, but it's a really huge step to take. And like, do you know what I mean about, about those boundaries? You've got that there. We found that through the years of working with Johnny, like you kind of found where. where <laughs> <you're coming>. <laughs> 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 no, yeah. We've got a very, um, you know, like certain people. We we have a profile, yeah. So um, could we talk about mental health? And some of it switches over into the public, and some of it's very. If you're in mental health, people will know who we are, right? Right. And then, but I always assume if they're not in mental health, they won't know who we are. That's right. not always the case. Some, you know, we've had a documentary and we've travelled yeah. and Johnny's books out and we've done stuff with the Royals and you know. So, mm. uh, where, where am I going? Where's my conscious now? I've lost it. So boundaries and our relationship, yeah. right? So, yeah, and obviously we've had to like go from zero to a hundred, and um, we've both learnt, you know, off each other a lot around, you know. I think I, I think I think this relationship is really interesting. Like off screen, it's fascinating. You know, you could write five <laughs> books about our. You, you're looking at me like. <laughs> well, no, because I haven't got any boundaries. That's the thing. No, ah. so he doesn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I literally no so boundaries. You just so like, no holds barred. Just this is me. Have it all. Yeah, and I mean, um, I've got myself into uh, some interesting situations. But it's not just boundaries about my stuff, but other people's stuff as well. Like. There were the first time I started doing this, um, on Twitter, uh, this young girl got in touch and she was like, oh, can I have your number? And I gave her my number. And um, uh, then we were, we were messaging a lot and I was trying to help her. And, but then she turned around one day and she texted me. She was like, um, I need to come and live with you because um, I, I have to leave my home. And, um, and I was living with my parents at the time, and I was like, oh my God, I'm living with my parents. Like, I don't know if I can have you. And she was like, oh, I can't believe this. Like, I thought you were there to support me. And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, just incredible, incredible guilt. Because, yeah, like, you know, I should have, well, it's just so hard, isn't it? Because yeah. um, you wanted to support that person. Yeah, you want to, yeah, and it's, it, it's so hard. Like, today, when, 
you know, young guy, like a young guy came up to us and he burst into tears after the school. And like, <laughs> sort of, well, you know, you want to put your arms around them. And I was like, sort of, you know, um, uh, you know, trying to hop, like, but then it's like, am I like, is Again, because okay? of this world yeah. that we live in, it's like you, mm. you in your head, you're like, is that the right? Oh, it's a young, like, should I be doing? Don't touch mm. the children. Yeah, well, yeah, well, that's seriously <laughs> it's like, like, it's so like, um, sort of messes with your mind about these, these, these boundaries, or messes with my mind about, yeah, what, what are the boundaries and it's so hard, isn't it? Because, um, um, and so my boundaries are just, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give, 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 give. Do you know what I mean? And then, um, so you said this today, actually, and it's something we say a lot, is, you know, on aeroplanes, when you do the safety checks and they say, you know, uh, when the oxygen mask drop, drops down, you know, put your oxygen mask on before you put anyone else's, even kids. And I've always been like, well, surely you put the kids on first. They're the most important. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the thing is, how can you help someone else if you haven't helped yourself first and put the oxygen mask on first? And yeah, it's a really, I like that sort of analogy. I don't always apply it to myself, but... I do like it about, you know, you've got to, I'm tr I try, it's so hard because, you know, you feel selfish when, uh, I feel selfish when, you know, I'm like putting myself first and, you know, taking care of my own mental health. Like, um, if there's someone else in the same situation as me, like really, in a really bad place, I'll go straight on to them mm -hmm. and like, mm -hmm. um, do you know what I mean? Whereas yeah. I know, I know maybe the better thing is to like help myself, but, it's hard to get it's a balance, hard. isn't it? Because obviously, like, you could even worry, or I sometimes worry, that you'd be obsessed with helping other people, but then that could actually end up being a nice big distraction from your own pain. Do you know what I mean? And like, I know. I've been warned about that. And, and just trying to find that vocabulary and those, those boundaries. Like, at the moment, I'm working on this TED Talk, which I'm doing next month, mm. and it's all about... It's called Social Media Save Me From Suicide, and it's kind of just it feels really like big and important. And a lot of it is me just trying to figure out, okay, well, what is it I'm prepared to say? Because it tells a story of how um, after I'd opened up, um, I got, um, I woke up one day to a bunch of trolling, basically on mm. Twitter from someone who, who said it was my own fault. And um, I was, I, I was, I should see how low I'd stooped and stuff like this. And then, um, so then when that happened, that really spun me out and I kind of was very quickly back to a place where I was like, I don't know if I can carry on living. Um, but part of it was just blaming myself. Like, I just felt like, you idiot, like you've made yourself so vulnerable so that people now can take a shot at you. Even to the point, like sometimes when I've been out <coughs> doing shows, like people want to talk to me and the guy comes up to me and he's like, oh mate, um, well, it's really great what, what you've been doing about mental health and like my, my, my partner got up and walked off one day and I don't know where she is and that was like a year ago and it's been really bad and it's been bad for you wasn't it because you wanted to kill yourself didn't you and I was just like I wasn't ready for him to say uh, that do you know what I mean I was at a gig like so it's just like things like that once you've put yourself uh, out there yeah you can't take it back and like I feel like in the interest of encouraging a conversation and encouraging vulnerability and encouraging supporting each other like how do we make sure that we're all doing that responsibly mm. and safely and and in a way that doesn't put ourselves at risk. Do you it's, know what I mean? It's such a, can I say though with the troll? So mm. I just before we were about to launch the campaign to find to find Mike Neil, mm. um, I started getting trolled on on YouTube. I make YouTube vlogs and oh god, YouTube commenters are the worst. They really are. <laughs> they really are. Like I, I like m music videos. Like if I watch a music video, I, I don't know why. I always go to the comments and they're this person's better than that person. This person sucks. This person, yeah. oh, it's so. Um, so I started getting trolled um, around that time, and it was really nasty, mm. um, like really personal attacks. And I was like, I don't know if I can do this. Mm. Um, but then, and, I, and and at first I started to respond. I needed to. I felt like I needed to, you know, justify, mm. you know, my, myself. But then I stopped responding because I was advised to don't. Yeah. But then, like mm, four or five months later. Got in touch. This this troll got in touch and was like, "I'm sorry. Like I was going through a really bad time. Wow. My mental health. And I saw you on YouTube and you looked like you were doing well. And that was so interesting. Like I was yeah. like, but it's hard. It's so hard because um, yeah. Whenever I get trolled, it's just like um, just sort of want to retreat. Just absolutely retreat. And um, 
yeah, again, there's that feeling of um, blaming myself. Like I've been too, I've been too vulnerable. I shouldn't have shared this. I've done, but you know, um, you, you know, you got to think about all the other people you have helped, helped and you have yeah. touched, and uh, that troll might be suffering themselves and you well, know certainly like and i could yeah the thing is i could see that like even when it happened i was like because i've been i've had online hate before but it hadn't been personal just been like oh bd man's a better beatboxer or whatever and it's like i don't know this really hurt me but i could see it was someone who was suffering is i could he see in the actually words. a better beatboxer than you bd man yeah well, that's <laughs> <joke>. <laughs> <laughs> um he's way better than me he's way better than me but um yeah like even though you know it's someone who's in pain and who's probably needs the hug more than the hate, like it doesn't stop it hurting you, does it? But it's, I think one of the things that really has sort of, I don't know, like mm, helped shift my perspective on things is um, doing work in prisons. Mm. You know, I don't know if you've ever been into. I'd done work with um, kids in like units. And, okay. And yeah, I've never gone into an actual prison. It's just. You know, when you listen to their stories, and they might have done things like, you know, you know, murdered people, and, and but you listen to, and I'm not sort of condoning what they've done, but when you, when they get really deep into like, what the hell they've gone through, and mm. you know, like, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's now like, yeah, I try and sort of, yeah, question everything. So, um, you know, when someone, Troubles me. I'm like, well, what is going on? What is really going on mm. with that person? And yeah, where? And yes, it does. It really hurts. But how much hurt is going on in them that they're, you know, firing this out? And I don't know. Yeah, for me, going into prisons and and, and hearing their their stories, I don't know if that makes yeah, yeah. That sort of has 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 yeah made me think a lot about you know um, why people do things. You know, people's motives for doing bad things, you know? Mm, destructive things. Yeah. I think I think you're right around boundaries because it's a protective mechanism, it can be, and um, I genuinely think that, uh, I know it's so long with me and Johnny, I, I just definitely know that our brains are wired differently, you know, my instinct is to throw up a boundary, right, mm. for, okay, because, you know, that is, for whatever reason, the journey has been so far, Put up a boundary, protect yourself, because then you're in the best place to, yeah, feel good and help other people. And your instinct is to go, um, you know, to not do that. And and both have downsides and, and good mm. sides. And uh, you know, I, actually, something I learned, and I I don't know where I learned it, but obviously I wouldn't have done if we hadn't have had that conversation on the bridge and we were on this journey. That. Um, you know, uh, a diagnosis like schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, um, is also like there's a big correlation between people's inhibitions in life, right? Um, and that, so I don't call it creativity or what you want, like so. Just um, it, it makes it makes complete sense to me that because I know that because I've I've read it somewhere I've seen you know that you will say something often with less inhibition about actually I know you say that you care what people think about you a lot more than I do but in certain circumstances you're very quick to actually um, dismiss your inhibitions and say what you feel mm. and I think wow that's so interesting because you know what that actually makes you the person you are and the diagnosis and everything is, is a whole you know I don't I don't separate you know you know, well, you're a person and you either have good mental health or diagnosis or you don't. It's like, for me, it's, it's, it's everything and one would feed into the other. It makes absolute sense, given the person that you are, mm. you're in a lot of circumstances, your lack of inhibition, that of course you have schizoaffective disorder. It makes mm. complete sense. Or you could put it the other way around. The fact that you have schizoaffective disorder means that you have less... It doesn't matter which way you frame it because one's not more important than the other. It's, it's the person you are. Mm. And actually, the fact that I don't have a mental health diagnosis and I'm more guarded, more... I've got more barriers up sometimes. Mm. That mm. makes complete sense, mm. you know? Because you, you know, talking about mental health kind of diving down the rabbit hole, listening to clinicians, listening to people with lived experience. Well, what you end up doing 
is essentially you end up just building your own relationship with mental health. What does it mean to you? How do you perceive other like what it? How do other people have their own relationship with it? That's completely your perception, you know. Um, and that's the only way to really understand this this thing mm. that for a lot of people is really scary. Um, it's kind of weird because it's happened by accident, right? So mm. if we hadn't talked on that bridge and the subsequent events hadn't have happened, I would never be exploring my mental health, my perception mm. of other people's mental health. Mm. You know, so it's just like it completely blows my mind that I'm been blessed to kind of go down this rabbit hole you know and and sort of have these these conversations because that's what it's all about isn't it it's about i love your it life, your I, love, uh, life. I love both of your energies and your positivity and how much you'll give it back to the world it's awesome um guys if you have enjoyed anything these guys have had to say on today's episode of we're listening please feel free to ask any questions or comments or Share the word or follow their example and be there for someone else or talk about something you've been through or share a truth of your own because I feel like that is what brings us all together and makes this world safer. Um, If people want to know more about what you guys are doing, where can they find out about it? Um, So, (laughs) go... Onto our charity website, uh, Beyond Shame, Beyond Stigma. Mm-hmm. Uh, onto our, you've got the This Can Happen website. Yeah, This Can Happen TCH events, which is all about workplace stuff. Mm. Um, there is, um, what else? God, we do so You've much. Got your book. We do so much, yeah. but so little. Yeah. <laughs> so much, but so little. <laughs> know, uh, we try to condense. So, yeah, your book. Stranger on the Bridge is now a book. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's in it. Um, and so is, uh, <laughs> they, they, they say the best all along. Prince William like, wrote the introduction. Yeah, right? I know. Yeah, 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 it's pretty cool. Yeah, um, so cool. yeah. So yeah, uh, there's loads of stuff online. Yeah, I mean, like, we used to be really good on social media. We used to keep up to like we would have, yeah, everything. We would have been like we're here, we're there mm. for you know the messaging, you know, mm-hmm. getting it out there. That mm. we've actually had to kind of. I think it's just been a conscious choice not to. Yeah. But, um, you know, there is some social media, you know, if you just type Johnny Benjamin, Neil Laybourne, mm. but <laughs> don't expect a response because that's just a personal choice. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it, my accounts are dormant, mm. you know, so they're there. So if anybody was to write a message on social media, you know, get a reply, don't be offended. It's just, mm. yeah, I'm just mm. kind of it's hold, time, holding that there. It's time, because mm. we're so yeah. busy, like, you just, this. You know, there's just a constant, constant influx of emails because of the work that we do, the talks, the, the conference, the charity, all the stuff we do. So you're dealing with constant, constant influx of emails. So doing the social media stuff, just time, it's time, mm. I think. There's something that we seem to talk about on every episode, like, and also because we're doing this on social media, so it's really relevant, yeah. but like, everyone who's come on here has had a different, different relationship with it, a love hate relationship with it, and it's. Yeah. An ethos of, I mean, very quickly about that, and again, don't mean it sound like an ego thing, but, mm. you know, g- people who have achieved great things in life, right, are written about. Mm. You know, if you go around telling everybody, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, trying to put your... Me- if you just focus on your passion and you achieve something in your field, people will write about you. Mm. You will find out that you are on social media and you mm. don't have to go on to... Do you know what I mean? Mm that's because you're trying to make a difference with a good mm. intent, right? Mm. So that's kind of, that's what I tell myself. So yeah, I, don't yeah, feel, yeah. I don't feel guilty about going on social media, you know? Mm. And I think mm. if people want to be successful on social media, generally, mm. just focus on what you're actually doing mm. rather than being on it. Because if, mm. you, if you're standing out from the crowd, achieving mm. something, beatboxing, mm. campaigning, mm. whatever it is, people will write about you. Mm. You will end up on social media by default. So mm-hmm. just get off your own, let other people do their thing. That's nice. what I say. Can I, can I say one on that note? I saw um, the musical Hamilton uh-huh, yeah. last night. Have you seen it? No, I've heard it's amazing. It's amazing, but it's all about this guy, that um, Alexander Hamilton, mm. um, whose story was untold for all these years, and now his story is like being told, and it's just, um, I don't know, it just made me think a lot since I've seen that about, you know, um, the impact that you leave on the world. Like, Alexander Hamilton left a huge impact on the world, but his story was kind of written out of history for his, the last few centuries. And now he's back in there because of this musical. And it's just, 
you just never know what yeah what impact you're gonna you're gonna leave on the world and so um I don't really have a final. I'm just. I don't <laughs> a know. Jerry Springer moment. Yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> I did, but just, just about you know. Um, oh, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Even um, yeah. just, just. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's an interesting concept, nonetheless. You yeah, know, yeah. like you, yeah, it's um, wow. Yeah. No, you can. Mm. Every 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 human action in the world is an infinite possibility for people to know about whenever it happens, however it happens, and that's the magic in life, you know. Mm. I mean, I'm experiencing it, right? You yeah. know, we, we talked on a bridge, I thought, well, that's it, and now we're, we're here talking to you. Mm. This conversation is there. You know, the your interaction moment, led you yeah. there, and, and, you know, and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And this, you know, people <clears throat> might watch this and then, who knows where it will, it's the, we talk about the ripple effect, mm. you know, so someone might watch this and then maybe they'll have an interaction. Mm. Not necessarily on a bridge, but with someone else that will then change their life, and you know that's what it's all about—the ripple effect, I think, mm. and positive stuff. So, thank you for having us on. Thank oh, you. Yeah, thank you. Really, thanks for everything you've been doing to help save mankind. I, just, <laughs> I think it's great. So, guys, um, thank you so much for tuning in and watching. We're listening. Uh, we are now an audio podcast as well, so um, you can check us out on any place that you listen to audio podcasts. Um, please leave a review, leave a comment, share this with anyone who you think would enjoy it. Um, and yeah, thank you again for watching. I'm SK Shalomo. This is Neil and Johnny, and thank you for, for being here. Take care. Goodbye, thank goodbye, you. goodbye, 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 goodbye.